So any comments or anything on the Astro Astronomy Photographer of the Year Award? That's a bit of a leading question, Dave. We're... <laughs> I'm not sure where you're going on this. It's going to be controversial, haven't you? <clears throat> Is he looking for a full-scale rant? <laughs> How's your you actually done the, done the photograph? Go for it. I was, I was just intrigued at how other people's um, opinions were compared to mine. Oh, is, is that one that's being... That's the overall winner. Oh, is it? That's yeah. the overall winner of the competition. It's, it's like a DD image, my, isn't my, it? Looks like a Tom Academy drive. <laughs> <laughs> it's a 3D image, supposedly. Yes. Mm. I think okay. the criticism you'd make of it is that it's a work of art rather than a work of uh, a record. It certainly yeah. shows the foreground star colours nicely. Right. So my astronomy shed's a bit late then. Yeah. <laughs> I think this is a technique of actually tilting the camera two ways so that the middle bit's in focus and the top and bottom bits are out of focus and blending them together. So uh, I've got loads of pictures like that. If only I'd known. <laughs> yeah. I can do that in Photoshop. I was going to say it's just been Photoshopped. <laughs> or Lightroom. It's, it's about five have, seconds have, work in Lightroom. Huh? Haven't they all? Allegedly. Allegedly, he put some sort of wedge to tilt it, as Dave was saying. But you're right, that's an effect you can do in Lightroom. Yeah, it takes about five seconds to do that in Lightroom. Yeah. There you go. The rain drops off the lens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good. It's nice, nice to hear other people's opinion and not just me go. It's a shame, isn't it, though, joking aside, because it really undermines the whole credibility of the award. And when you, and when you look at some of the pictures in there, they're absolutely stunning. Yeah, yeah they're absolutely stunning, and that's the overwinner. But anyway, I'm, I'm not a judge, so, I, you know. Yeah, well, I looked at the judging panel, and quite a few of them come from the sort of fine the art side rather than yeah. science side. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Explains a lot then. Okay. okay. Any other comments anyone wants to make? <laughs> I think there were yes. far better entries than that one that won personally. Yeah. Quite a few were a lot better than just my my opinion. I prefer the Aurora shot. The Aurora one was stunning. Mm, the Aurora was nice, yeah. That was amazing. Yeah. Mm, yeah. It's you know. Anyway, let's move on because we're gonna run out of time otherwise. <laughs> Yeah, so just a look at future back meets. I know you've seen this before because I haven't made any. Oh, that's all out of sync. But anyway, <laughs> um, next week it's on the Monday evening, 21st of September, where we've got Paul Money because that's the only day he could make because he's got other talks going on. So it's next Monday. Okay, so uh, not the Tuesday. And then another general one like this uh, on the 29th. And then the 6th of October, we've got Pete Williamson doing Herschel to Hawkwind. So uh, looking forward to that. It's really good. And then on the 20th of October, we've got Phil, who's going to talk about space missions for next year and Mars Explorers as well. So that should be quite good. So looking forward to catching up with some of those missions. Is uh, Phil in tonight? I didn't know. Could yeah, I'm here. Oh, yeah. hi, Phil. Yeah, thank very, you. Very, very busy. Very, very busy year next year. Yeah, it looks so, like it. From the uh, Mars, Moon, asteroids, lots and lots going on. So look forward to presenting that. Brilliant. Cheers, Phil. Excellent. So we've got again the pack program really. Um, so he's trying to fit everything else in. Uh, so from October, of course, we're going to the fir first and the third Tuesday of the month from next month. And for those, nothing organised for the third yet. The 17th of November coincides with National Astronomy Week. I know I'm going to be busy trying to live stream stuff for them as well. So hopefully we're going to get Mars um, live streamed. Um, and do sort of, sorts of other things. So I'm not sure what the schedule is going to be for that week yet. And then it'll be the 1st and the 15th of December for going forward for the rest of the year. And so tonight's meeting, we all heard yesterday the big announcement about phosphines found in Venus's yeah. atmosphere. And Julian, oh, there he is, is volunteered yeah. to do a talk all about it. So Julian, if you'd like to uh, share your screen, I better make you a um, co-host for you to be able to do that. 
Right. When when you say talk all about it, I've got about ten slides on it. So <laughs> and that's great. I yeah. don't know anything more about it than the rest of you. Yes, since yesterday. So uh, um, there we go. Right. Let me just. And if you haven't watched the Sky at Night yet, it um, is a really good um, overview of what happened. Okay, Julian, take it away. Can everybody okay. else can mute? Please. Can see That'd that? be great. Yeah, okay. yeah, great. <clears throat> so, is there life on Mars? No, uh, Venus. And as the subtitle says, I really didn't see that coming. I don't know about the rest of you, but uh, I knew there was a big announcement coming up because uh, Chris Lintop had hinted there was going to be a special sky at night and so on. So, there's so much to astronomy, you do wonder what it could be. Anyway, um, just a little bit of background because I happened to have tripped over some clues to this that. Um, when I put it all together, it, it seems a bit more obvious, but and anyway, I clearly missed it because uh, it was a complete surprise to me too. So uh, where did the ideas come from? Uh, now I happened to be in a seminar type thing with um, this lady, Sarah Seagar, who's a MIT exoplanet hunter. And she got some really interesting ideas. It was about a sort of 50 minute talk on how to, find exoplanets and so on. And she was looking at a different way of doing that. Well, you know, finding exoplanets is almost old hat now. Everybody can find exoplanets. So she was more interested in the atmospheres of exoplanets and looking for life. And she was coming about it in a different way and saying, well, what sort of simple compounds can you make out of just the basic building blocks of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur, I think it was. Uh, and if I just sort of do a like, I just throw them all together, uh, what, what can I make? And she came up with this database of possible biosignatures uh, of 14,000 molecules that could possibly exist. And then they went through them and sort of said, uh, well, you know, which of these would naturally occur and wouldn't be evidence of a biosignature? And which of these would be completely out of kilter with uh, what we would expect from normal atmospheric processes and all that sort of stuff. And there's a paper uh, towards a list of molecules as potential biosignatures. Anyway, during the uh, talk, she, she mentioned phosphine quite a lot. And I thought, oh, that's quite interesting because um, it's not something I'd, I've only ever heard of it as a sort of um, a toxic gas and so on. So it wasn't really up there as a list of, uh, in the biosignatures. But obviously now, because this was about three weeks ago, she gave this talk, uh, obviously it was uh, uh, sort of bubbling under, uh, well, from a long time, uh, but yeah, he sort of uh, hint, hints that uh, this was gonna come up. Uh, the other player in it, which uh, I think she was, was she on the sky at night? I'm not sure. Uh, she's certainly been on the news and uh, some YouTube videos is um, this lady, Clara Souza Silva who spent her whole PhD looking at signatures of phosphines uh, for how you could detect them with um, spectroscopy and uh, where they occur. They're mostly in the infrared because uh, you know, they're, not, they're not pure elements, it's, it's, a, it's a gas. And they certainly occur quite strongly in Jupiter and Saturn's atmosphere, but they're, they're generated as far as I understand it, quite deep down, we're under high pressures and um, extensive amounts of energy sort of put in, very hot uh, pressure cooker that is Jupiter, and then they sort of bubble up and uh, they kind of get destroyed in the upper atmosphere. Uh, so she spent her sort of whole PhD looking at the signatures of phosphine and how you might be able to detect them, expecting them to be used for the studies of Jupiter Saturn. And I think she's now at MIT with Sarah Seeger. Uh, so, uh, then go to apply that to exoplanets. And so she was rather surprised to get a call saying, uh, we think we found phosphine on Venus and we know you're an expert on this. Uh, so I imagine that was quite a, quite a surprise. Uh, but the person who did it, uh, you probably know is Jane Greaves from Cardiff. Um, and she had some time on the JCMT, James Clark Maxwell Telescope, which is this one over there, which can look uh, in the sort of millimeter frequency so into the infrared and um, well, fairly deeply into the infrared 
and uh, had some time on that. So she thought, um, I suspect she'd heard these ideas. Well, she clearly worked with Sarah Seeger. So she knew these ideas about phosphine, uh, but they, uh, whereas Sarah was clearly looking at exoplanets, she thought, well, I can have a look at Venus and uh, indeed found a signal and was rather shocked, I suspect. So she applied for ALMA time, uh, which is this one over here, which has a much better resolution, uh, but is also much more difficult to get time on because um, everybody wants to use ALMA. So uh, she managed to follow it up with that and uh, did indeed find uh, signatures. I've got some of the graphs later on just in case you're interested, but uh, they don't mean very much to me. But So what is phosphine? Uh, so it's just uh, phosphorus with free hydrogen. So it's a really simple molecule and uh, pretty uh, straightforward. Uh, smells like rotten garlic or something, but I think it's actually odorless in its pure form, but uh, uh, it quickly decays into uh, other things with these uh, strong pungent smells. And where is it found? Uh, well, I said Jupiter and Saturn formed in the hot interior. Penguin dung heaps is also uh, very popular, as you can see here. And uh, anaerobic bacteria, so certain classes of bacteria can produce phosphine as a byproduct, uh, but uh, it's fairly deadly to anything that uses oxygen as a, uh, a normal metabolic process. So uh, not, not good for us, not good for the vast majority of life on Earth, but those that don't need oxygen, they, they seem to generate it. Uh, and yes, this is a paper, um, when, when was this? Oh, this? This was earlier this year, 31st of January, 2020. So this is Sarah Siva and Clara where they were suggesting that phosphine could be a biosignature gas in exoplanet atmospheres. So it was clearly um, under consideration at that point. Uh, and then we had the announcement on Monday. Is that only yesterday? It seems a long time ago. So there's uh, Jane Greaves and you can also see Sarah Seeger and uh, Clara also amongst the uh, authors. So very well done. And this is what they detected. This is the uh, this is the sort of dip that uh, is representative of phosphine. Uh, this was done. Oh, that one's on Alma. This was on the JCMT. You can see here it's much less resolution, so you have to sort of more squint and uh, fit these lines to it on the JCMT, whereas Alma is much more precise. And Alma can also give you some idea of about where on Venus it is. So whereas the JCMT is sort of taking the whole of Venus and saying, yes, I found something in it, Alma can sort of break it down into, this is polar regions, the equatorial regions and south polar regions and so on. And uh, so the surprise is that it was found somewhere in this layer here, the phosphine layer is somewhere around the uh, near infrared images taken of the cloud layers of um, Venus. And that is quite warm. It's around about 20 degrees centigrade. So, you know, very similar to Earth temperatures and about one atmosphere. So that's pretty good. Of course, if you go down to the surface, it's about uh, 450 degrees centigrade, something like that, and 90 atmospheres. So a really hellish environment down there. They say, you know, lead and um, other metals just run as liquids on the surface of Venus. And uh, the Venera probe that landed lasted for 45 to 50 minutes before it succumbed to um, uh, just falling apart. And that was about the seventh attempt to land something on Venus. All the rest had died early on descending through the, uh, the clouds because they were just unaware of how hot and how uh, high pressure it was. So of course the problem with this for life is that these clouds are full of sulfuric acid. And as um, uh, I think it was mentioned on the sky night, that's not a good um, uh, place for life to be. They, they had some very interesting experiments with uh, beakers of sugar and uh, other things. Peas, I think they also dissolved sulfuric acid. So this is, yeah, this is problematic. So on one side, you've got phosphine, but uh, we don't have a good explanation for how you might generate that outside of life. On the other side, you've got sulfuric acid, which is pretty, uh, pretty um, nasty to nearly all forms of life. There are some forms of life that um, these, uh, what are they called? 
uh, extremophiles that can live in very acidic environments, but I'm not sure there aren't many that can live in uh, such acidic environments as this. So uh, I think the jury is still out. So that's about all I've got to say. I was just going to finish up with this last quote. This is direct from the Nature paper. So this is the bottom line that they say the presence of phosphine, pH 3, is unexplained and after exhaustive study of steady state chemistry, photochemical pathways, with no known abiotic production routes in Venus's atmosphere, cloud surface, subsurface, or from lightning, volcanic or meteoritic delivery. So they've been through all the sort of possible ways that you might generate phosphine, but it is very quickly, uh, uh, once, once it gets into the atmosphere, uh, the ultraviolet light will quickly split it up and uh, combine it with other things in the atmosphere. So this, this is why it's a, a biosignature. You have to have something con continually producing it, otherwise it will just disappear. Same, same way with oxygen, you know, oxygen will just disappear if there is nothing producing it all the while. There's very reactive uh, substance oxygen, so it quickly combines with lots of other things. So that's all I've got to say, and uh, I hope you haven't got many questions because that's about all the knowledge I have on the subject. So uh, anyway. Brilliant. Thanks, Julian. Absolutely fantastic. Anybody got any questions? I've got one. It seems quite obvious that it's in penguins' dung heaps, that the whole of Venus is covered in penguins. <laughs> well, that could be. They'd be very high pressure penguins. Yes. Or, or maybe maybe they've learned to fly and they uh, they drift <laughs> around in the, you know, they got Sky Base 1, like, uh, what was it, Captain Scarlet? They, yes, they had a. Something that floated around in the clouds. Yeah. Thank you, Julian. Just an excuse to get pictures of cute penguins in, isn't it, really? Let's face it. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure it can be penguins because um, my recollection of the sky at night says that, um, that the phosphine is concentrated um, uh, away from the poles and the sort of mid latitudes. Uh, uh, very good point. Very good point. Yes. Yeah. That. Very blown. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks, Julian. Brilliant right. for doing that. Thank you. Will that stop sharing. Okay. So yeah, I've stopped sharing. So everybody can see. So tonight's meeting, as well as that, we're going to talk about the opposition of Mars. We're going to do some image processing. Uh, so was it who was it requested the mineral moon demonstration? It was me, Paul. Oh, uh, Paul, yeah. Yep. So the mineral Thank moon, you. I'll do that one. And of course, the planets, they're all at their best at the moment. You've got Jupiter. Hello, what's Colin doing? Chicken. <laughs> 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 he's playing chicken. Brilliant. On the skit. That's so. Um, and of course, Mars as well, which you're going to talk about, and anything else that anybody else wants to think about, uh, talk about. So, uh, oh, somebody's got something in the chat. That's a pole life or just plain chemistry? Yeah, Dave, I was thinking. Oh, no, I've got, oh a pole, yeah. Oh, yeah no, I got in the right mess last time I did that, didn't I? <laughs> you can only get Let's back try it. Let's try it then, shall we? Um, Oh no, I'm going to get in the right mess. No, no, <laughs> maybe next time I'm going to get in the right mess. Right, okay. So, opposition to Mars. Um, so, here it was at the first of the month, or first of August. Uh, so, it's gone around here, and on the 10th of September, it started going in the opposite direction. So, it started retrograde motion. So, it slowed down and then started in the opposite direction. So, 1st of October, it's going to be there, and then opposition. That's where it's going to be. So it's more or less at the highest it's going to get at, at its best now. So get out there and have a look now because uh, it's showing some nice detail at the moment. Best I've seen it and best I've managed to capture it as well. And then towards November, middle of November, it's going to stop um, retrograde motion, become stationary again, then it's going to go back in the opposite direction. And then by the end of the year, it's going to be over there. Okay, so... Uh, Yep, so that's where it's going to be. It's in, in Pisces, so this is one of the uh, lines of Pisces, and that's the other one there, of the ribbon holding the two fish together. Uh, so, yeah, so it's big, it's bright, and if you haven't got up and have a, had a look at it, what are you doing? Get out there 
yeah too much sleepless nights so here it is um there um it's going to be its brightest minus 2.6 and of course if you are up early morning you've got orion coming up as well and the pleiades and the hyades so you know winter's definitely on its way uh, so it's in pisces so here's what it was like two years ago at opposition when it was a perihelic opposition closest to the sun uh, so it's at its biggest and best of course it was low down but they didn't get a really good view because of the uh, um, dust cloud uh, but this year it's not that much smaller so when it's at opposition that's the size it's going to be so it's not um, not quite as big but it's not far off so it's already started to give us some really nice views as it gets bigger so here was an image I took on the 7th of April so just to remind you I think I showed this to you before anyway so that's the size it was in April and then May and June is getting bigger and July and August so I started imaging it in August so this was with my old camera 120 MC and have a look at that so that's the image I got and I was quite pleased I got some detail you know got some dark features and you when you compare it to a simulation from Stellarium yes I've got some of the features but yeah it's very hazy um, but it's getting bigger so this was September so this was a couple of nights ago I had a nearly all nighter I went to bed about half past three I think it was um, and I had about 45 minute kit while I was waiting for Mars to get a little bit higher and for the uh, volcanoes to rotate into view um, so when I compared my looked at my image closely um, just to see what features I'd got right, I've blown it up quite considerably so I'm going to leave this one as it is yes I've got the shrinking polar cap down here and that has that has shrunk um, in the past couple of months when I've been watching it it was a bit bigger than that and there was a little cleft in it which someone captured a few weeks ago but I haven't seen that since um, we've got some of the dark features this one's called terra serenum and then we've got this hazy polar clouds these are actually clouds on Mars as well so I'm quite pleased to be able to capture them uh, but also got Valles Marineris of course that was the big canyon that uh, the Mariner probe found all those years ago um, and of course if that was um, on Europe it would stretch almost away across Europe that's how big that thing is so it's much much bigger than the, uh, the Grand Canyon and if you look really carefully using averted imagination this is Olympus Mons that bright patch there and then you can also see the three bright spots of the Tharsis volcanoes as well so I'm absolutely chuffed at that so I'm hoping I can get better as we go forward so uh, don't look at it too closely you can see some artifacts creeping in from the chip but hey there you go so as we continue it's going to get smaller so november still going to be reasonably big so make the most of it and then it's going to sh start shrinking quite rapidly as the distance from earth increases and again don't uh, go out the same time on each night because it's got a similar rotation period to the earth you will see the same side so you need to either pick different times of night close to each other if you're going out on successive nights so that you see different features or wait for them to revolve into view and if you see something like uh, Sirtis Major which is this big triangular bit it will come into view slightly later each night okay so if, if you go out at the same time it will be further to that side of the disc and it will gradually disappear off the edge of the disc because it will rotate into view a bit later each night okay so these um, volcanoes and things that i was capturing over the next few um, days they're gonna come over the limb later and later each morning so you know if you want to catch them you've got to catch them now because um, they're not going to be visible for a little while until we start to see the other side come into view okay <clears throat> so make the most of a long session which is what i did the other night and that's why i missed a really good clear night last night because i was just so tired i had to have a, a, a tip and what I personally do recommend, oh dear, um, short focal length really um, to make sure you get reasonable magnification, but don't overstretch your telescope. Make sure you don't, you know, make sure what the um, capabilities of the telescope are, because if you use too um, short focal length an eyepiece, then you can uh, just smear the image too much. 
Um, but if you've got a Barlow lens, you could use the eyepieces you've got. And if you use a Barlow lens, that'll actually give you the shorter focal length or the longer focal length of your telescope to give you a bigger image. Hope that helps. Okay, so that was what I was going to talk about, Mars. Any questions on that, anybody? No? I mean, it's, it's really impressive. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't believe what was coming off the camera. Yeah, that's Just, really good. No, that's ridiculous. Yeah, so uh, really pleased with that. So what I'll do then, if I can uh, open... demo so if I share this screen now go back to there so affinity photo yeah can everybody see that one yep this yeah. is this is an image of the moon that I took um, just before uh, eclipse of the moon and what I've done I've stacked a number of images and put them together so that I get rid of a lot of the noise so that's um, one of the things I do. Uh, so th this was taken before the eclipse started. Um, so it wasn't taken for this particular method or to get this detail out. It was just an image I took before the eclipse. Okay, and great detail. Uh, so to get to get the uh, colours of the moon, you can just about see there's differences in. The surface here in the Maria surface, you can just about see that's slightly different. Okay, but they do look slightly grey, maybe slightly brown. Okay, so the first thing I do with something like this, and I also use this for all my webcam imaging of the moon, and also this is how I get some of the colour out in my um, uh, deep sky images as well. So if I make a duplicate layer of that, so this is different. If you've read the um, Sky at Night article, that was all in Photoshop because that's what they asked me to do. But I'm showing you this in Affinity to those of you who have gone over to Affinity. But the method is virtually the same in Photoshop, which is slightly different. So what I do, I make a duplicate layer. So I've got two layers over here exactly the same. And then the top one, come on, I make that into a luminosity layer. And what a luminosity layer it does, it sort of locks the value of the levels of grey in an image because images are made up of different levels of grey. So all these pixels around here are black. And obviously there's different levels of grey across the moon's um, features. And so that luminosity layer locks those levels of grey. So it doesn't matter what you do to the background image, it doesn't affect. So if we brighten that, just use the curves to brighten that, you see it makes there's no effect on that image at all. It might You might see something coming through, but there's not much happening. OK, I'm going to delete that. So what you so that's giving you your levels of grey because it's a luminosity layer. The background layer is now the only thing that's giving the colour information for that image. So that's not coming from the top layer at all. So if you select the bottom layer, and then up here you've got two buttons here. One says auto colours, and one says auto white balance. So I click that, and what that does, that balances red, green, and blue in the image. And then what I do then, you go to vibrance, and then you just increase the saturation. I usually use about 20 or 30%, not any more than that. And click merge. And what that does, that merges that curve with the layer. And then I'll just go back to vibrance again. And do another saturation. In fact, I do it three or four times, maybe. So I've actually set a standard setting in here. Saturation of 30%. If I double click that and merge, I don't have to keep playing with it. And there you go, you get some colours out. There's the colours starting to appear in the image. And how far you go is entirely up to you. There are lots of people who really go too far with this. Um, but that's probably about as far as I'd go with that. But you can see those colours are starting to come out. And then once you've done that, you can then go to the top layer. Remember, that's um, fixing the levels of grey within the image. So if you want to make any changes to the brightness or the curves, you have to do it on the top layer. 
So if you go into curves, and then if you want to adjust those, you can then play with how the moon looks brightness wise. And that really is how it works. So it's quick, it's simple, and it uh, it just sort of works. So you get all these, you know, you see the differences in Kalo Mari Imbrium here. You can see this really brown area around Aristarchus and Schroeter's Valley <laughs> there. I've got a question, Dave, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, what, why did you have to do the auto colour balance at the beginning? Because I thought if you wanted the true colours to show through, you wouldn't necessarily yeah, want to balance if you, if you don't do that, it tend, tends to shift the colours in. You know, the colours aren't quite right. Right. Yeah, I think I think it's a green bias because it's a DSLR image. It's a green okay. bias. The other thing, if you're doing webcam imaging of the moon, what you sometimes see where there's bright peaks and things, you might see little coloured fringes around those areas. What you need to do, go back to the background layer and then just apply a Gaussian blur to the lower layer. You still keep the colour, but it gets rid of those coloured little fringes around the edges. Okay, and you will get those. So just give the background layer that's giving the colour information a Gaussian blur. How much you do that will depend on the image, but that normally gets rid of those bright coloured fringes around bright objects. On the moon. Okay, thanks. Okay, so that's about it, really. And then all you do is Joe layer, and you can either um, merge everything into a single layer, or you can just export it. So export, and you can you know save it as different. Change the size of it before you export it, etc. So it's quick, it's simple, and uh, you can use that technique to get uh, colours out of your deep sky objects, your webcam images, all sorts of things. Um, yeah, but you can certainly see the difference in uh, colour between uh, Mari Tranquillitatis, and I can never remember the name of that one. Let's just let's just make it a bit more. Let's go let's go mad. Here we go. Oops, hold on. Yeah, merge. And you can see, you can, you can go crazy if you want to. And if you look at the uh, Astrophotographer of the Year Award, someone won an award for doing exactly this, didn't they? Did you see that one? There you can see, you can, I don't know if you can see that really clearly, but you start to see some colour noise coming through now. So that's the point where you go, OK, I'm going to just blur the background the image so that I get rid of some of that noise. See, you can't, so if you... You don't blur it, you get the colour noise coming through, but if you blur it, you can see that smooths out and disappears, but you still keep the colour. Yeah, and if we if we hide the top cut, the top layer, you can see exactly what that background layer looks like. But that's given the colour for the image shown through there. Okay. But that's gone way too far for my liking. But there are people who put them out like you know, out there just like that. Dave, can I ask, is there any particular reason you use Affinity rather than Photoshop? Or is that just a personal uh, preference? It's just, well, everything I've done, I've, I've learned in Photoshop, but I've, I've transferred all these over to Affinity Photo um, since towards the end of last year, really. Um, mm. And I quite, I really like Affinity. You know, I think it's really good. And of course, okay. if you, if, if you uh, buy it, it's forty eight ninety nine, and that's it. You don't pay for any any other charges unless they bring out a major update. Then they might ask you for an upgrade, but it will continue to work. You know, you won't have to pay that upgrade if you don't want to. Whereas yeah. with uh, Photoshop, you know, it's whatever it is, ten pound a month, going on infinitely while you're still using it. Yeah, one hundred and twenty a year. Yeah. And you can buy it, and, it, and it's, you know, Mac as well, John. But you do have to buy a license. You, there's, there's a Mac license, there's a PC license, and there's an iPad license, but they are separate. So if you've got a Mac, you want to use it on a Mac and a PC, you'll have to buy two different licenses. But, but you can use it on as many computers as you like. All right. That's good. Thank you.
They did the offer for £28 as well, which I took up and I've been playing yeah. with. So. Well, I bought Designer as well, and that is a fantastic package. That's really nice and easy to use. So, uh, yeah, I got them really well with Designer. So that's how I created my uh, logo. If you see my new logo, I recreated my logo using Designer, and it came out really, really well. I was thinking we do in lockdown is great, isn't it? <laughs> so was someone going to say something there? Yeah, I was a beta tester for that. Oh, were you? Yeah, yeah so I, I, had should, I should have got into it years ago because I think it was about five years ago someone said, Oh, have you seen this? And I thought, oh, I haven't got time, you know, I don't want to learn any new software. So I stuck with Photoshop. And then towards the end of last year, I thought, Oh, there's a big interest in this. I think I better learn it. And yeah, and see if I can get a bit of that. And now I've, I've, I've converted myself to using affinity all the time i've found it intuitive to use as well yeah it's, it's really yeah there's things that work differently to um photoshop um but once you get your head around some of those little things the really the really annoying thing for me is these adjustments because i drag mine out because they they're normally sitting on a menu under here i drag them out and put them here so they're always visible and i can see my layers while i'm working hmm. Um, you can't change the order of those, so you can't drag them up and down to get them so all the ones you want together. And they're not listed alphabetically either. Which, but anyway, yeah. So I think that would be nice if you could move those around. Um, but uh, yeah. Well, did you just literally lift those out of the right hand side there? Yeah, so if you just drag that, yeah, you uh -huh. can, uh, they normally sit in there, I think, adjustments. So if you want to see your layers, you want to make an adjustment, you have to go to there. And, okay. yeah, so you just lift that out and pop it there. Okay. You go. So they sit yeah. there and then you just make sure you layers it so you can see your tools and your layers all at the same time. Am I on the bottom okay. layer? Yep. Yeah. Adjust your vibrance and on the top layer, adjust the curves. Uh -huh. Yeah. Very good. Okay. Any other questions on that one? I'm just going to say thank you very much. That's mm. all right. Always happy to. There, there is there is uh, the Photoshop version is is on my website, so I did pop that on my website a while ago, mm. um, and then I'll probably leave it a few months, and then sometime in the new year I'll probably put the uh, um this one in as well so people can see the uh, affinity mm. photo okay so that's that one how are we doing for time folks oh we've got a little bit of time yet so yeah so no it's okay let's stop that share okay so that, shall i show you a little bit of how i do my um image processing for the planets then Yes, please. Right. Yes. Okay. Now this, I'll have to share my screen here because I've done this before where I shared this and people only saw a little bit of it. Okay. So let's have a look. Um, share screen. And I'll have to share the whole screen. Oops, scary. You can see yourselves now, can't you? Let's pop down out of the way. Right. Okay. So what I do, I'll go, I'll, I'll, I've prepared one earlier as I do. So as a demo, so this is one of the um, AVIs that I took the other night. So there you go. So you can see it's, uh, so I've, I'm using auto stacker. So it's got these two windows, which is really annoying, but there you go. Um, so I've loaded the uh, video in there and you can see as you go through, there's what, 12, just over 1200. And you can see the scene shocking, it's shaken up and down and all sorts of things. Yeah, so it's over 1200 images in there. And I normally have the settings, so it'll be on planet, I leave dynamic background ticked, gradient I leave as is, local I leave as is, auto size ticked. Uh, I don't press sharpened, it does sharpen images up, but I think it does it too aggressively, so I don't have that ticked. RGB align, leave that. And then the other thing I do is a 1.5 times drizzle with my webcam images. If you're using bigger chipped cameras, that will crash the program. So be careful on that. So you have to 
you know strip down um have a sort of area of interest on your camera so you're not using the full chip uh, but the 1.5 i'll show you what happens later and then what you do you click analyze so it sits there and it's analyzing all the images that uh, it's taken and then you get a ticket here and then you have to go to the other side and you pick a size of these alignment points so i'm going to pick 24 because it's a planet and it gets covered in these little green blue boxes with the dots on okay so it surrounds the planet and if you change this brightness it'll actually you can actually make it less so it doesn't um so if you're looking on if you're using an image of the moon where it's bright on this side and dark on the other side you might find that it gets to a certain point and then the rest of the moon hasn't got any boxes on you can adjust this down so that you get that darker bit with the alignment points on it but with the moon images i don't usually use such a big um alignment point size i usually use 104 for mine so place alignment points in grid it does that and then go stack and then it sits there and it chugs through all those images and it creates a single image out of all those images and see it takes a takes a while with this camera dave if i could just ask a question yeah um i notice you've left your frame percentage as a hundred percent is that what you no 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 sorry yeah no i should have yeah thank you thanks kev i normally use about 20 percent. that was because the other day i was i was well i'm doing an article for the sky at night on stacking dslr images and so i've just used this program to stack all the all the images so that's why that was 100 percent. yeah normally on my webcam images i normally do 20 percent on average but if the scene's pretty appalling i'll drop that to 10 percent yeah. if the scene's really good then i'll up it a bit because the more images you put in the less noise you're going to get mm. okay so then stack that i'm just wondering whether i put the right in, right uh, video in here but we'll, we'll have a look in a minute anyway so as you see it, it takes a while to chug through just talk us through the quality graph there as well, Dave, please. Oh, yeah, well, this quality graph, so it shows you the really good uh, images and the really appalling images. Okay. Yeah, so this is 50%. Um, so I'm going to select, I've selected 20%, so it's only going to do the image okay, with up, up this part of the quality end. Yeah, and there's a little green line there as well that you can move across, I think. Is there? I've never, I've never. Well, on the left oh, this one here. Yeah. Oh right. Okay. No. I've. Oh yeah. I've never. Oh yeah. Okay. I, I, I've never. I've never played with that before. See. All oh, right. Okay. That's what I like about doing these demos. Oh, I've done all sorts <laughs> of strange things now. I think. I think I'll do that again. <laughs> yeah, if well, one, I've one messed it up. One yeah. useful tip that I discovered recently on the quality graph. If you hold down the control key and click on the, the green uh, curve that you were showing yeah. at, at the chosen level that you, you feel you want to make the cut at. It will auto-populate the pink and green boxes in the top right. Right, okay. Because uh, the, you, the other thing you can do, if you think, well, do I use 20 or do I do 10, you can actually put 10 in there as well. And, yeah. when, you, and when you stack it, it will do two images, one with 20% of the frames and one with 10% of the frames. Uh. Okay. So you can, you can, you know, so if you want three or four, you can. It takes a bit longer, but it will do it. So if you put a 10 there as well, yeah, there you go. So it will produce 20% yeah. and a 10% at the same time. I usually save mine as a TIFF file. Mm -hmm. uh, so, there, so then I'm going to stack that. It's quite a graph still gone funny since I clicked that, but never mind. Let's see what happens. <laughs> fun of live demos <laughs> and, and Dave can I ask one question um do you use some do you always use so many alignment points because I always tend to use maybe um 10 or so oh really yeah I don't, don't use that many okay well because I, I read somewhere that um if you use so many you could end up with like um, a crazy paving type effect yeah I, I have seen that before yeah so that's why I, I dropped down to 104 for my um you know because because i've not really done many planets for quite a while now i'm still sort of learning my way through this and trying to get the best results 
Right, there we go. It's nearly there. It's going to crash, isn't it? Oh, no, there it goes. There you go. Yeah, you, you can end up with this crazy paving effect. I'll probably end up with crazy paving on this one. And that's it. So that's auto stacker done now. So then the next step, I use Registax. And go to desktop and uh, demo it is. So we should have two images in there. One you can see 10 and one at 20. Mm -hmm. okay, so I'm going to open the 20 first and see what happens. There we go. There's, I might, I might have picked the wrong image, but no, no, there we go. Never mind. And then this is, as Kev knows, this is a bone of contention with everybody. What um, wavelet settings do you use? I usually use linear and Gaussian. And then what I tend to do, I normally tend to bring that one up quite a bit. And these a little bit less. I have picked the wrong AVI, haven't I? Demo because I'm not getting anything out of that. Live demos, don't you love it? Right, let's start again, folks. Let's start again. Right, open. I'm going to go to my image processing folder now rather than... I didn't see there's a few here. Right, that looks a bit better. Right, okay. So analyse this one. I thought this was the uh, image I'd popped in there, but it obviously isn't. It's an old one. There you go. So, oh uh, yeah, this has got nearly 5,000 images on it. Yeah, so we, we try the smaller one anyway and see what happens. That seems to be too small to me. But we'll go for that. Okay. And then let's stack. So this will take a bit longer because it's a lot more images. It's just getting into a routine of doing these things. I find I come back to it and I can't remember what I did the last time. <laughs> yeah. I've written a procedure, but then I'm, I'm a bit geeky. <laughs> <laughs> Carry over from me work days. Yeah. Of course, once you've got your wavelet set, you can keep it as a preset for anything else. I'll show, I'll show you that in a moment. Yeah, so if you're doing one, you can have one set up for each of the planets that you're photographing. Yeah. Whilst, I, whilst I'd agree in principle there, Roger, what I've found through experimentation is that wavelet settings are very, very much individual image dependent. Yeah. So you can optimise a wavelet preset for one image. And if you use that same preset on another image that is seemingly the same, taken with the same kit, you, yeah. you will get a very different result. But it gives you a starting point and you can adjust oh, it. Yeah, one just, I, was, I was going to show you that in a minute. Right, that's it. That's done that. Right, let's go back to Registax and open the correct image. Right, file. And we need to go oh, back to here. Uh, 2020 planets. And these are the two it's just created. So uh, we'll open. Is that the 10% or the 20 But Let's open the 20%. There we go. Okay, so there you go. So that's the image I took the other night. And then if you save, you can open those and it gives a little bit of a curve adjustment and it just takes what you've done already. Okay, so you can see that it's uh, these are ones I've done before. And that one actually gives the best mm -hmm. result at the moment. So you can see you can slide these. But this is the sort of setting I use. The bottom one is normally further over to the right than the others. And these I normally don't touch hardly at all. But you see that detail starting to pop out of the image there. And then the other thing I do, because the color is normally wrong, if you go up to RGB balance, 
and then click auto balance that balances the uh, color up okay and then once you've done that you need to do all it then does the whole thing and then save the image and I normally save that with a W just to say mm. I've done a wavelet sharpening on it mm. and then save Dave, I find that the RGB uh, align can be quite useful if you've got any fringing. Yeah, it, 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 this one, it's it's an absolute... I've got to get right in it. It's, it's a, yeah, trying to get the X and Y position of the um, red you and blue. You can just drag the box around the disc and I usually find it... To click the estimate and off it goes and it's pretty good. Yeah, I, I've, I've not really played with that that much and when I have, I've... I find I've made things worse rather than um, All right. better. Just press the reset on the box. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, just that's what I've done many a time. Press the reset. Okay, so that's once I've done that, I'll save that now as another image. And then I'll go to Inf Affinity Photo. And I'll open that image I just saved. So I need to go into here. <coughs> What's the other side? Uh, that's the one I just saved. Oh, you can see a bit of. That's probably the way we're looking at it, I guess. No, it's not. Do out of it. Okay, so then you know I'm not like these purists who have to have it the wrong way up because that's what the telescope shows you. So I, you know, I always turn mine round so that south is at the bottom. And then what you can do there if you want to sharpen it up a little bit more and you've got to be careful here because uh, too much sharpening is horrid if you go to the live filter layer and go to sharpen and then you can unsharp mask and then if you do a radius on that and a factor and it starts to sharpen the image up a little bit more but again don't go too mad there you go and then just merge that with the image and you've sharpened it up again a little bit more and the other the other thing I was going to show if you go into uh, I don't I'll have, to, have to stop sharing that one and go into my desktop is this Astro surface have you seen this one uh, so you can stack images with it And you can oh that's a wavelets one we don't want the wavelets one we want um, one that's not had a wavelets on it uh, 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 uh. hold on sort by date modified that's just one of those and then this one if you use filters it does this deconvolution R Lucy and that's way too much but that's another piece of software to play with as well it's, it's doing all sorts of strange things with this one at the moment but uh, that's another piece of software that you can play with is this Astro surface so have a look for that one as well because that can stack images as well as um, get detail out of them as well so you can see that's uh, done a reasonable job as well okay so that's another piece of uh, software to look at is that separate to affinity Dave oh yeah this is a free a free uh, so it's called Astro surface Astro surface, Astro surface. and um yeah i can't remember where the link was but it was yeah I, I saw someone do a demo it was in french uh there it is yeah so it's easily found there you go so astrosurface.com there you go well, cheers dave so there's another bit of software to have a play with and see what you can get out of your images so uh yeah Is that pc or um uh, I think it's PC, so uh, <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay, there you go. So how's that? How's that, folks? Is that okay? Thank you. 
very interesting day. And again, if you want to get a bit more colour out of Mars, do the same thing. Do a um, luminosity layer, increase the saturation of the uh, layer below, and then you get the uh, colour a bit more. Dave? Hello? I've got the uh, laptop microphone up with me at the moment, so it might be very quiet. Um, I'm just going to say, when you were um, doing your RGB, you were know, letting the colour balance show your light um, in Registrat. Yeah. Uh, I had a problem with uh, the 2004 application where the Mars was kind of close as again. Um, and I tried processing out the blue uh, edge on the edge of the, on the limb, and it turned out it was actually the atmosphere on Mars. I didn't realise that. Uh, yeah. That yeah, it's got the clouds on Mars, which is what you've got in the northern. <laughs> Part of the moment. Yeah, and I never throw you images away because then you'd see somebody else post and they said, oh, I've captured you. Go back, look at yours. Go, I didn't realize I'd got that. So, yeah. No, you've got your images there. I've been going back into a long time when Veggie Stacks 2.1 came out and it was the bees need that Veggie Stacks 3 came out. I'm having a lot of now. But in the meantime, I chose. I can I can hardly hear you, Dave. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, I was just uh, commenting on the process of uh, the way things improved from Registax uh, to Astro Stackers. At one time, Registax was the king. But very slowly, Astro Stackers took the lead on the planetary. Yeah. But, you know, it, it's well worth keeping those old images and redoing them in later, later software. Yeah. As you learn new Absolutely. techniques, yeah, you get you get more out of the images you've had sitting there that you didn't realise you had stuff on, yeah. Exactly. I'll take my mic off now. Can yeah, great stuff. Cheers, Dave. Okay. Any other questions? Look at that. That's filled the hour quite nicely. Yeah, very good. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, any questions from anybody? How do I improve my memory? <laughs> <laughs> Can I just make a comment? Yeah. Uh, I use uh, high dynamic range um, software and it seems to work very well for the moon. Yeah, if you, um, yeah, because it, it brings out the uh, darker parts. Any slight. As opposed change, to the lighter parts. Any slight change in the surface, uh, it, bring, uh, it's really, it exaggerates it really. Yeah, what I, the way I do that, let's see if I've got an image I can show you. Hold on, let me see if I can find a moon image I took. Uh, I'll show you how I do that. Uh, I'm just going to pick a image at random, so it probably won't be the best image to use, no my luck. But no. Uh, Right, we try that one. Okay, so if I if I share this now, okay, so this is as it comes off um, Registax after stacking. Oh, I've got a little bit of a pixel, uh, crazy paving effect on there. I didn't realise. Okay, so this is as it comes off the webcam. So the way I do it, this is not going to work on this image because it's not brilliant. I go to layer again, new live filter layer, and down here you've got shadows and highlights. If you click that, what you can do, you can bring up the dark stuff, but leave the light stuff. So that's the way it gets stuff out of the Terminator. Yeah, so use these two to actually bring things up. So you see that crazy paving effect has come into play there. <laughs> but we can get rid of that later by making that darker. So that's that's one way you can get the dark part out that's in shadow a little bit more and a bit darker than the rest of the moon. So that's what I use all the time to do that. Let's see if we've got a better image in there to use. Yeah, that's not sharpened yet. So we'll pick one that's been sharpened. There we go. So we've got, you know, this is a lot darker up here. So layer, 
live filter layer, shadows and highlights. And I just use that to bring up the darker part a little bit more. Obviously not the best image to use, but there you go. And so I'll show you what um, I do with the color as well. So if you go duplicate layer and then make this into a luminosity layer, I'll just show you how that works with the, uh, so we're going to increase the uh, saturation on that a few times. And if we zoom in on that, you will see that you've got this colored fringes around the craters. There you go. So you've got this reddish tinge. So if we go into that background layer and we apply that Gaussian blur to that lower layer, still got the color there, but it's now that fringing has gone. So if we now zoom out to fit, you can't see any color fringing around any of those bright parts. And then again, go back to the top layer and we can do a Sharpen it again using a live filter layer, sharp and unsharp mask, just to sharpen it up just that little bit more, get a little bit more out of it. But again, it's very easy to go too far. And what you can do sometimes, if you create a duplicate layer of that and work on that layer, so we're going to go live filter layer and sharpen that with an unsharp mask layer. And we're going to do it so it's just slightly too much. Yeah, so we're going to do it a little bit too much and merge that. And then what we're going to do, we're going to change the opacity of that layer so that it applies the sharpness and the, the, more, the more we reduce the opacity of the layer, the less that sharpening is applied to the image. Yeah, so if we're all the way to the left, we see in the bottom image, which is the unsharpened one. And if we move it, and as we gradually apply it and increase the opacity of the image, it applies the sharpening. And so we pick a point where it's applied the sharpening, but it's not too much. And then leave it there. So that's applied the sharpening, but not overdone it. So there's all little ways that you can sort of adjust your image to uh, get what you want, basically. Okay. There you go. Another little tip. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Well, any other questions before we go? No. Oh. Have you got any images of uh, Neptune, uh, Dave? Oh, uh, I've got. I've got a very, a very old one. Um, okay. It's only a monochrome one, and it's very overexposed. But you can see Triton next to it. Ah, uh, right. Yeah, I, I tried. To, I tried to have a go at it a couple of days ago, and yeah. I'm not even sure whether I had it or not. It, it, looked, it just looked like a star. I couldn't even. Yeah. I wasn't 100 percent sure if my go-to was aligned properly. Yeah. But. No. It's it's diff, It's a difficult one. You know, you and this is a bit better because you can see the disc a little bit better. Yeah. And I've yeah. got I have I've got a webcam image of you uh, and us, and you can see the color, but uh, it's so tiny, it's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Neptune is even fainter and smaller, so uh, I've not really tried that apart from trying uh, Triton a while ago. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but it's just a monochrome image where Neptune is actually overexposed, and you've got a tiny little star next to it. And that's it. <laughs> it's the only <laughs> real image of uh, Neptune I've got. Okay. Yeah. Okay. If there's no other questions. We shall depart. And I'm going to say Thanks, Thanks, those words. Okay, Have a good week, everybody. Thank don't you, forget. Dave. Don't forget it's Monday. it's Monday next week. So make sure you don't miss it and don't try and log in on Tuesday. <laughs> Roger, right. main, man. Okay, folks. Thank right. Thanks, well done, Dave. Thanks very much. Yeah, Bye. keep Bye. safe. Bye, keep well Bye, and Bye. keep looking up. up. <laughs> Cheers, folks. Bye. 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 Bye, Roger. Bye. Bye. And see if you can beat Roger next week. No. <laughs>